Okay. So if you want to follow what I'm doing right now, right? So, and sorry I didn't even get a chance to like, like introduce myself, but you know, we are on my Twitter profile or my ex profile. So, you know, you can just like dig in there to try to figure out who I am or whatnot. But um, let's just focus on like really what's the task today, right? So I started to do this thing called basically Coliseum Gym because Coliseum is basically starting on, uh, I believe, September 2nd or in about 23 days or so, right? It's just starting. You can quickly sign up, form a team. I believe like teams of like two, three, four, they just raised $60 million, which means that actually teams coming out of here can easily get their project basically funded. Right. It is not easy, obviously, because there's a lot of people all over the world who are basic, who are participating in this thing. But I believe that you should participate, build a team, right? And, like, and we can talk about like how to maybe like build a team, actually. And you should also like read Coliseum's uh, tweet recently on their, on, uh, about their blog and uh, the post that they have about like how to win hackathons. I think it's very actually interesting to read, basically. Trying to build a team. And then from the team, maybe build something very, very small. Right, build something something very very small. Um, you can um, you can uh, you know like demo uh, showcase. Maybe it has potential. Maybe you can actually get funding, and maybe you and your team can like go on to build better things. Or maybe you can use this as a basically way for you to showcase your skills as a developer, and then from there you can like you know maybe find a job or whatnot. Right, but I would advocate this today in this age of like crypto and tech GPT and all this stuff. Right. Is it really like wise to go and actually try to go find employment somewhere, right? Where I believe that if you get those skills today, that you might be actually better off like applying those skills to yourself. I believe today actually with everything everything that I have mentioned so far up to this point, that DeFi and decentralized finance, which comes in with crypto and blockchain and all that stuff, and we can talk about it more in detail along the way, right? The reality is that these things, man, are permissionless and allows for anybody anywhere in the world to build a DeFi business, to build a decentralized finance business. And it is permissionless, and you basically, I believe personally, that you need only low capital to basically get started. Right? So how do we build these things, these like details or whatnot, right? You know, or whatnot, right? I believe that actually you could use any kind of platform. Today, if obviously, if Bitcoin had smart contracts, I would be working on Bitcoin actually as a way to like figure out a way to build what I'm trying to build today, personally, from a, actually from a, from a project, right? But the problem is that Bitcoin does not have adequate smart contract capabilities. Yes, it has something called Bitcoin script and certain things, right? There's RGB, another protocol that's coming up. But all those things are fairly limited to me because you still have, you are still limited by the limited set of scripts that or capabilities that basically Bitcoin script has. So no matter what you're trying to basically layer on top, you are always limited to the capabilities of Bitcoin script. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you could put it in the comments. Maybe I'm wrong. You know, I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert in no shape or form, right? There's Ethereum. I started my career in Ethereum as a smart contract developer with Solidity, right? But the problem with Ethereum is that if if it's very expensive to transact. Okay? So I want to build something with smart contracts. What is my first choice? Obviously, it's ETH. Because it's like it has the second market cap in, uh, um, uh, if you go to coin, uh, Gecko, ETH got the second market cap, right? Number two coin after, after Bitcoin. You got Tether, it's a stable coin, doesn't really matter. Then you got BNB, you know, it's another thing. Then you got Sol, number five. Right, but for me, I want to build a again DeFi business. So what does that really mean? Which means that I want to provide value, and for that value, get rewarded by the fees that that value that I with the value that I provide. Okay, but we took at we took at basically um, the volume for the last twenty four hours, not even a market cap, because obviously this is basically ranked by market market cap, right? Market cap, cap, cap capitalization, number of token multiply by the price per token and you get the market cap of this particular token. That's why Bitcoin is number one, Ethereum is number two, and so forth, and BNB and Sol Solana is number four, number five right here. Okay? But let's look at the volume for the last 24 hours. Right? Transactions. This is where we want to provide value. 
right? And if we provide value here, we will for sure get part of the fees that are being generated by this number of transactions. Because all the actually transactions, the fees don't only go to the blockchains, but they only also go as, as, as a reward to people who provide liquidity for these particular platforms. And we can think of basically at this, at this blockchains, every single one of them as a on-chain economy or a separate economy itself, right? Bitcoin can serve a single country. Ethereum likewise and Tether and, and BNB and so forth and Solano, right? These, actually, these ecosystems can literally like really deserve like uh, nations. So, in, so actually on their own, they are basically like actually on what they call actually on-chain economies, okay? So there are like all these capabilities and all these possibilities available today, right? So I think that hackathons are amazing because they force you to build something, right? They force you to basically bring, think about something, right? And usually it's basically building a service or a product, right? Because if you actually, again, go back again and talk about why actually are we here today, right? Most likely because we want to make money so we can take care of ourselves and our loved ones. Right? We want to make money, take care of ourselves and our loved ones. How do we do so usually? By either going, getting employment, a job, offering a product or a service, or some other ways. But usually, actually, those are basically three ways we can make money in this world. Getting a job, I'm not sure. Building a product or a service, 100%. Okay? So Coliseum and this, this, this particular basically hackathons, they, they, they force you to build the stuff actually. I am a multiple time hackathon winner. You can check my resume. As a solo hacker, as a team uh, hacker, I've built it all. On Lightning, on Ethereum, anything. Right? So it's always an amazing experience because you always get a chance to build the stuff and actually build the camaraderie and build teams and all these things. And not only did you get a chance also to get, get some money, I believe that actually Coliseum, the first one, the first one edition, they were giving teams like 250k. With 250k, you could for sure build a product or a service. Right? Because again, what do you want to do? We want to take advantage of these on-chain economies. And we want to build applications, or in the case of Solana, what they call programs. We want to build these programs, right? We want to take these programs and deploy them on-chain to generate revenue for us for a service that we provide. Provide a service, generate revenue. So how do we service this on-chain economy? And the only way to do so is by either writing and deploying on-chain programs or by communicating directly with on-chain programs and actually and actually uh, doing uh, actually transactions with them. Okay? So usually what happens is, you know, you can build applications, what they call off-chain applications, which means that basically you build this application, you deploy some kind of cloud, and you, you know, communicate with on-chain application on the blockchain itself. It sounds complicated, really, and actually, if you think about it, but actually, how does that happen? Or well, what is even an on-chain application? What is an off-chain application? Right? So for me, if you look at the internet or crypto and Twitter and YouTube and all these things and all these speculators, the only way you can differentiate yourself, yourself and understand whether or not this token or that token is better than this token or whatever, right, is to dive into the technology. Then you can make your own assumptions. You can make your own assertions, right, and understand actually why one is better or whatever over another. Okay? So... I want us over the next 30 days to learn Solana. Solana is difficult. I'm not going to lie to you. Even me, I'm struggling learning Solana. And I've, like, I've doubled with you know, a lot of technologies in the past. But Solana is taking the time for me to basically wrap my head around it. But a lot of people um, say that the best way to, to like really learn it is to teach or to share information. So since I see this opportunity, which, is, which, which actually I believe can benefit anybody in Africa, in Asia, in whatever, Latin America, any, any other developed countries, right? Anywhere where, where there is unemployment, but you have a lot of devs, they, can, they just can't find employment. I believe they can like really get their hands dirty today by trying to work with crypto, but most specifically decentralized finance, because I believe it's highly underrated. 
And every, even this morning, I saw Hayden Adam from Uniswap tweeting it this morning or sending an X message. I'm not even sure what they call those things these days. So what do we need to do? So this, what I have here actually is just uh, iTerm, right? I use uh, iTerm uh, because I like it, prefer, I prefer it. But if you, if you actually have a Mac, Mac comes in by default with terminal, right? Terminal, if you type terminal, this one comes in by default with your Mac. It kind of looks the same, you know. Check that out, see what you have, right? This is my directory. So this is basically terminal. It's just a regular, what they call shell, that comes in with your, with your Mac, and you can use it to access your shell prompt to talk to your computer, right? And if you look at it, this actually, if I, if I see it to desktop, right? If I, uh, actually allow, okay. Uh, if I do a listing of these things, you will see basically all these files are basically my files here that I have. This is basically my folders. And you know there are folders because it starts with a D here. Right? Actually, no, sorry. Uh, you know it's a folder because it starts with a D. Then you get the permissions. And this is actually very important to know. Right? Because if, you, if you're going to get talk about security and all those things, you actually have to know what these actually things mean. Actually, right? What is actually? But that's beyond the scope of what we're trying to do right now, right? Okay. So if, it, if you look at here, all these things, Algo, Audio, Books, t Docs, Images, ML, Next Wave, Positions, Projects, Solana, Travel, Video. It's all my, basically, my folders here and my desktop. So this is just basically a, a, text, a textual way to, to navigate your computer, right? But of course, there's more to it because then you can execute programs and do way more things. But it's the same way as navigating your computer, but it's just basically via text, okay? And you can like delete files, remove files. Let's say I want to remove that freaking that DS file right there. Boom. And if I go back, that file is gone, right? It's no longer there. Localized, blah, 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 on all these files, okay? But I don't use terminal. I use iTerm, and I customize it, obviously, to you to look this way, the colors and everything else, right? But I use iTerm, but it's the same thing, exact same thing. And today, we're going to use iTerm to start our tasks or whatnot, okay? So, now, what do we need from iTerm? What we, first thing we need basically is that today, again, as the um, uh, as the, uh, the the tweet mentioned it, we're going to talk about basically doing an install fest, which means actually we need Rust obviously today because we're going to be learning Rust. We're going to learn the first two chapters of Rust, and we're going to do actually we're not going to do the first two chapters. We're going to do basically chapter one and part of chapter two. I will show you how to do it, and then you will finish it as your homework. And this is going to be your only actually kind of homework-ish. On this particular thing but it's uh you build a guessing game but i want you to build this guessing game over the course of the next week or so right you don't have to do it right away or your homework but make sure you do it right to basically stretch yourself right it's like a stretch goal if you don't do it it's on you man uh like my man kevin samuels was saying man you can't you, you can cheat yourself but you can cheat the game right unless you try you actually type the stuff and really, really work on this stuff and type on it and like really like exercise your your, your finger muscles man you're not going to learn this stuff man Right? You're going to have to code and code and code and code, man. It is actually very, very, very actually important. Okay? So do not watch me type. You type yourself, you install, and you basically become a hacker. Right? Because if you don't install the stuff, if you don't know how to install it, just go to ChatGPT. Right? I use that. This is, this is a ChatGPT. Chat, chat I just use the version, uh, the desktop version on Mac. Right? That's why it looks like this. Otherwise, I'll go to the web. But I'll, I prefer to use it on my computer because then it's more native. So ChatGPT, right? I come here and say, hey, buddy. Uh, how do I install Rust on my computer? Question mark. I have, I have uh, a Windows computer, or I have a Mac, or I have a Linux, right? In my case, I have a Mac, but let's say Linux, let's say, right? I'll say uh, maybe I have a Linux box. Uh, I have a Linux machine. Okay? Boom. Tells you exactly what to do. Boom, boom, boom. So the update, install build essentials curl, right? Proto, boom. The on the bash shell, you install Rust, and so forth. Okay? Make sure it's installed. And actually, this seems like it's coming straight from the book itself, from the Rust book itself, right? Uh, everything else here okay so that's what you need so now 
We're going to come back to chat GPT. We'll basically keep, keep this window open because this is going to be our buddy today. And uh, we have uh, this stuff here. But uh, let's go back now to the Rust book. The book that brought us here. And sorry it took us about 30 minutes, but I wanted to get, wanted to, start to, like, to loosen up, find some motivation to tackle this thing because it's quite a bit, but it's not a lot. Okay? And I mentioned also here, here, how to learn enough Rust for Solana. And actually, this is, if anything, this is the most important piece I want you to get from this video. Right? The most important piece I want you to give you actually is that you don't have to be an expert at Rust to learn Solana. You do not have to be an expert at Rust to learn Solana. Okay? And the reason actually being that a lot of people get a lot of people get confused actually, but you don't actually need Rust. Actually, you don't need that much Rust for Solana. What you actually need is Anchor. <laughs> and Anchor is a Rust framework for writing smart contracts for Solana. Okay, that's the basically thing, right? That's what the only, only confusion for. Oh man, I gotta like write some smart contracts for you know what I'm saying, but I gotta learn Rust. My Rust is difficult, blah blah blah. I'm like Rust actually is not that difficult. Rust is just like any kind of uh, like programming language. You just have to like a couple of things you have to understand, like borrowing ownership and the borrow checker. How does it work and all that stuff, right? But uh, otherwise, it's not really that difficult, man. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's not really whatever. What is difficult actually is understanding the mechanics of Solana, the blockchain, how it works, and understanding Anchor. And we'll get to Anchor because on this bootcamp, we'll be learning Anchor, Rust, and Solana. Right. I didn't put it here this time, but I just want to put it out there, right? But I, I didn't want no confusion. So today, for the sake of what I want, what we want to learn, let's not actually think about actually Anchor, and let's think about basically like Rust itself, right? So we're just Rust, right? We're gonna just focus today on the first chapter in one and two, and in the meantime, also let me show you what you can do to learn this stuff. Okay? So if you look at the entire Rust book, it's about twenty-one chapters. 21 chapters appendix, so don't have to worry about that. Chapter 20, final project, building a multi-threaded web server. Okay, so 21 chapters. But do we really need all the 21 chapters? Obviously not. We don't have no time. Coliseum starts in about three weeks or so. It will last about four to five weeks. You will actually also have time to develop your skills and learn while you build. Learn, build, act like, really try it out, check it out. Okay, so today, we will, what we will do again, we will go through this stuff, and I don't want you to scare, scare you, we're going to only focus on about eight chapters. Today, we'll basically do chapter one, get started, we'll do chapter two, the guessing game, but we're not going to do all of it, because I want you to focus, I want you to basically do this as your homework, because if I was to basically to, to be like a publisher of this book, I wouldn't put chapter two here. I think actually chapter two is very discouraging for beginners, right? I'm not sure exactly why they had it here because maybe they want people to just jump into it. I think they mentioned it actually in the text, in the particular text we'll read together, right? Actually, if you want, you can jump like straight to th straight to three. But if you want a more hands-on, if you have a developer, you, already, you actually already have experience, then I would say like, yes, try to check chapter two. But if you're a beginner, skip two. If you are a beginner, skip two. Yes, yes, Jim, thank you. So we got the gym here, right? So let's open up the gym with Visual Studio Code, our best friend. Okay? And uh, don't worry about Visual Studio Code. It's a little bit, mine is a little, like it looks a little bit different because first of all, I have my uh, my my navigation uh, to the right. Okay? So that's usually, this actually bar is on the left. But for me, it's very kind of awkward. Why do they have this bar on the left when I'm writing basically from left to right? And I read from left to right. Why is this? Why is this here? So I always move it here, and uh, of course, like my uh, my shell is also here on the bottom. Uh, you can see it here, right? So we got all the files that we have uh, for the repo, and this repo is the same. Um, that's on the GitHub. Uh, that's my all my old GitHub. I got locked out of it. I'll explain it how that happened. I'm not even sure. But if you go to my GitHub, basically, bot mechanic, Coliseum, uh, boom. Then you can see this here. Then I explain uh, what we're going to do on the first two weeks, uh, how to install Rust, a shortcut of the command, copy it here, 
uh, how to set up your Visual Studio Code, right? It's very important. This guy, uh, let's get Rusty. Shout out to him. Dope uh, video uh, YouTube channel for uh, Rust. Then we have uh, what we're going to cover here, right? So everything I, I just talked about, everything is in the GitHub repo. That is on the uh, tweets. If you scroll, that GitHub repo is right here. Okay? If you scroll here, the GitHub repo is right here. But mechanic thing, right? Uh, Coliseum Gym. Okay? So there you can see here, right? So when you see here, let me just blow it up so we can put a home as you can see, right? So what we're going to do again, um, we'll basically basically cover about eight chapters. We're going to do like chapter one, skip number two and make it as homework. I'll, like I said, mentioned before, we'll, but I'll do some of it with you guys. Uh, and then we'll uh, do uh, uh, chapter three, common pro programming concepts. Chapter four, understanding ownership. Chapter five, uh, using structs and uh, related data. Uh, enums and pattern matching, number six, very important. Uh, managing growing actually project and packages. This one actually, I was going to skip it, but I'm like, wait a minute, hang on a second, man. Because if you don't know how, how this works, when you see an anchor project, you kind of confuse a little bit, right? And it's very important to understand how Rust actually projects are set up. So you understand how like libraries work, how packages work, and so forth, right? Very important. So number seven, we'll do, we actually have to do it. We're going to have to eat our vegetables, all right? Number eight, common collections. Amazing, right? This is actually really going to be the core of it, right? Common collections, right? Now we're going to do like vectors and all those things, or how to store data, how to manipulate them, data structures, and so forth, right? So we'll get that, right? So every single one of them, when you click on it, it will basically take you directly to the chapter that you need. So I linked it all nicely for you to the book, so you don't have to worry about it, okay? So this is what we're going to do, right? So again, we don't have to worry about doing uh, 21 chapters. We're only going to do about eight, again, right? Getting started, uh, common programming concepts, understanding ownership, Structs and data structures and related data, enums and pattern matching, managing growing projects, packages and crates and so forth, common collections, and error handling. We come to here, so it's going to be our eight projects actually. So we're going to do one a day. If you can do it for the next eight days, I don't know if it's going to happen, but let's see if we can do that. Now, after we stop here, it is not finished. What it means is that now it is on you to learn the rest of it as you go or as you need it. You got ChatGPT as your best friend. You can ask it whatever that you basically need to do, right? Anything that you can basically need, it could do it for you, right? So the idea is that like, um, the idea is that from here, from chapter nine now, you're gonna be on your own. But number 10, do it right away because it's gonna be very important because again, about lifetimes. And this trips a lot of people up. Right? And if you look at Anchor, actually, projects, you, you're going to have to understand how actually lifetimes work. Right? And it's funny, actually, uh, my book, uh, uh, Black Hat, Rust, I'm not sure if I should uh, show it here uh, because it's a copyrighted book. I don't want to have no problems. I, sh I shouldn't believe it like that. Okay. But in the book called uh, Black Hat, Rust, Right, uh, by Sylvain Kurkur. Uh, amazing book, man. This book right here. If you want to understand about like risk security, this is a book to get, right? It's an amazing book, man. And in this book, in one of the chapters, I believe in chapter, uh, maybe in the intro part of it, right? It talks about actually why he would delay learning lifetimes as late as possible in your risk journey. Right, this guy, uh, right? Applied Offensive Rust Security with the Rust Programming Language. Actually, amazing book, right? Very hard. But you move slow, you move slow. How to eat an elephant a small bite at a time until you finish, okay? So, um, yeah, so um, lifetimes, right? So this, chapter 10, once you finish, the next, over, over next next few days, we finish this thing, and are you happy? You understand the basics of Rust and blah, 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 or whatnot, right? You're ready to tackle some Anchor, some Solana, or whatnot, right? In the meantime, on your spare time, start tackling the rest of it, right? Generics, traits, and lifetimes. Very, very important, but we're not going to do it in this particular thing. You don't actually need it right away, right? So I'm going to skip that, okay? Writing automated tests. Very important, of course, because you need to write tests. So you're going to have to do this on your own. Building a command line application. Very important. Very actually sweet, short, short project, right? You build a command line, uh, command line thing, and actually it's like a really 
like cool. Uh, it does. Um, uh, it's like a mini grep. You build a mini a grep like the grep command, the the, the grep uh, command line uh, grep, right? You build this thing called mini grep, right? And you go through all of it. Actually, it's an amazing actually project to get you to learn all the stuff, right? So do this one number twelve as soon as you can. Okay. Now the other stuff, functional language features, more about cargo and crates, smart pointers, fearless concurrency, object orientation features of Rust. Pattern matching, very important. Maybe this one actually you have to like maybe double look look on this one. Advanced features and the final project, building a multi-threaded web server. This we don't need. None of this stuff we need, right? So we're gonna only gonna be all the way up to nine, and then from ten you on your own, but do it as soon as you can. Do it as soon as you can. I thought I'd write this notes down actually on markdown because I know you're gonna forget all the stuff. So let's just basically like uh, you know make sure that we actually do it right. So what do we need actually? What do we need to do? We just basically need to do is like this. You either go to how do we get started, right? How do we get started after all this stuff, right? How do we do this stuff? Okay. What you need to do is you need to go to Google and you type uh, the official. Rust, boom, boom. Go to the first link it gives you. That's not an ad. Click on it, boom. You get to the book itself. Okay, and this HTML is amazing because it's very much so. We can we're gonna have to take it. If you got a Mac, I'll show you a way we can use it. Is put it on full screen so that once we can basically once you once you close this, this can like contract or retract on text, and I'll show you why this is important later on because we're gonna have our 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 browser right next to it, right, to learn. I mean, our editor right next to it to learn, right, okay. So, do this. Second way to access the DAX on, on, on Rust. If, after you have Rust in, in uh, after you have Rust uh, installed on your computer, and the way actually you can actually find out is by tapping the, um, the uh, word uh, cargo, and if you see output like this, that means that your Rust is installed on your computer. If you see this, Rust packet, Rust packet manager, blah blah blah. Then Rust is installed. But if you type, if you type cargo, and then and then there's no output, then you need to install Rust, right? And actually, but we'll, but we'll get there in the next in the next video, in the next sorry, in the next in the next steps here, right? So how do we get the, the DAX within the Rust Rust code? If after we have installed Rust on our computer, how do we get access to the DAX itself, right? So Rust, and don't worry about this. We will learn how to use this. Has this command called Rust app, right? Rust app doc dash dash book this actually let's say you, you are somewhere in the woods you don't have internet it's perfect because then you're gonna learn rust why not having internet being offline i was doing it in senegal all right boom so you see here the url is not a http it's just a path to your file local file system okay it basically goes to apple darwin share dot rust html book index html and it basically pulled this up so usually, personally, me, this is how I use it. Because then when I come here, what happens actually usually when I come here and I do a Rust up update, to update my Rust, it will pull down all the changes, including the new version of the book and so forth. Okay, but I did, I, I did this this morning, that's why I don't have it. I mean, I don't have nothing to do, nothing to update. Everything is pretty much downloaded and updated. Okay, so now, now that you know actually how to open the book, right? either go online to the URL, or go on your command line and type rustup dot such such book and it will bring it up. And actually, the command actually is right here on the first page of the book itself, right here. Boom. Okay. Right. So, what do we do today again to do? We're going to read chapter one line by line, word for word. We're going to attack the code line by line, character by character. We're going to run all the codes on the command line and then we'll do part of like uh, maybe oh, we'll just look at the chapter two and then we'll come back to it because we want to get to the meat of it actually ASAP. That's why I'm dedicating, I'm pushing chapter two towards you so you can do it as your homework and make sure you type it up as you see it, make sure it runs, you get the output and get your fingers typing. Don't even think about what it means, just type chapter two as is. All right, so let's drink some water, get some coffee. So. Let's read. I apologize, I'm not the best reader. I'm like a little bit dyslexic. <laughs> but we're gonna have to read it, so you're gonna have to deal with me. All right, so the Rust programming language. The Rust 
programming language by Steve Klapnik and Carol Nichols with contributions from the Rus community. Carol Nichols again, this name is very important. She's an amazing woman. She has a video on YouTube called uh, Rust for the Next 40 Years. Rust for the Next, uh, no, Rust, a programming language for the next 40 years. I believe you should basically check it out, see what it is, right? And um, and go and, uh, and like, yeah, man, and like really understand why Rust is important because Rust is winning, man. Rust is winning blockchains. Rust is winning security. Rust is winning everything. Just have to learn it, man. This is what it is, man. Just won. Rust winning. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So, okay. So, Carol Nichols, remember her name? Look up a video on YouTube, right? So, let's get it going. Okay. This version of the text assumes you are using Rust, Rust 1.671 release 223 some, 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 or later. Okay? The installation section of Chapter 1 will install Rust or update Rust. All right? You just saw me update Rust, but again, you can install it. All right? The HTML format is available online at this particular link, the one that I showed you earlier, right? This, show, this link right here, this is where you can get it. Or I'm checking it again from my local machine. And offline with installations of Rust made with Rustup, Run, and you can run Rustup Dax book, right? This is exactly how I open it up. Okay? I just type this command Rustup, where is it? Rustup Dax book, open up the book. Simple as that, right? That's how I got this page. Okay? So we got it there, right? So several community translations are available, also available. So I'm sure French is available there for people in Senegal. You can check it out, you know. This text is available in paperback, ebook format from No Starch Press. Okay, whatever that means. So you can uh, get it if you want to format. Maybe sit by the beach, crack a book open, learn some rust, man. It's never too late, man. I know it's summertime, bro. I know it's summertime, man. I know you want to be out there at the beach chilling, chasing Big Booty Betty and all that stuff, man. But hey, this code ain't going to write itself. You feel me? All right, so let's read the foreword, man. It's important. So like I said, we're going to read every single word of this book. It's an amazing read. <laughs> it's, it wasn't always clear, but the Rust language is fundamentally about empowerment. No matter what kind of code you are writing now, Rust empowers you. Rust empowers you to reach farther to program with confidence in a wider variety of domains than you did before. Take, for example, system levels. Work that deals with low-level details and memory management, data representation, and concurrency. Traditionally, this realm of programming is seen as arcane, accessible only to a select few who have devoted the necessary years learning to avoid this, its infamous pitfalls. And even those who practice it do, it do so with caution, lest their code be open to exploits, crashes, or corruptions. Rust breaks down these, bar these barriers by eliminating the old pitfalls of providing a friendly, polished set of tools to help you along the way. Programmers who need to dip down into lower level controls can do so with Rust without taking on the customary risk of crashes and security holes and without having to learn the fine points of fickle toolchain. Better yet, the language de is designed to guide you naturally towards reliable code that is efficient in terms of speed, language, and memory usage. Programmers who are, who are already working with low-level code can use Rust to raise their ambitions. That's what's up. <laughs> For example, introducing par parallelism in Rust. Let's say it again again. For example, introducing parallelism in Rust is a relatively low-risk operation. The compiler will catch the classical mistakes for you. And you can tackle more aggressive optimizations in your code with the confidence that you won't accidentally introduce crashes or vulnerabilities. But Rust isn't limited to low language system pro systems programming. It is expressive and ergonomic enough to make CLI apps, web servers, and many, many other kinds of code quite pleasant to write. You'll find simple examples on both later in this book. Working with Rust allows you to build skills that transfer from one domain to another. You can learn Rust by writing web apps, then apply those same skills to target your Raspberry Pi, this book fully embraces the potential of Rust to empower its users. It's a friendly and approachable text intended to help you level up not just your knowledge of Rust, but also your reach and confidence as a programmer in general. So dive in, get ready to learn, and welcome to the Rust community. Uh, Nicholas Matsakis and Aaron Taro. Welcome, 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 welcome. We are here. All right? Let's keep it moving. Introduction. I can't, can't believe I'm reading library and then they were like, yo, this guy can't read. <laughs> He's highly retarded. 
said, I don't care, bro. I don't care. I'm the one reading. You ain't reading. You want to watch me. Anyway, so introduction. No, this, is it, this edition of the book is the same as the Rust programming language available in print and ebook formats from no, no, uh, no starch press. Remember again, this book, I'm uh, loading it from locally from my computer. So again, it's the same edition as a book that's list listed actually on a print version, if you get the print version. I, I, Rust doesn't change that much. So if you buy the book, I'm sure in 10 years it's going to be the same. It's going to be working as well, right? So don't, you don't have to worry about it, okay? So let's actually read slow. <laughs> Welcome to the Rust programming language, an, an, an introductory book about Rust. The Rust programming language helps you write faster, more reliable, software. High-level ergonomics and low-level control are often at odds in programming languages design. Rust challenges that conflict. Through balancing powerful technical capacity and a great developer experience, Rust gives you the option to control low-level details such as memory usage without the hassle, without all the hassle traditionally associated with such control. Who is Rust for? Rust is ideal for many people for a variety of reasons. Let's look at a few of the most important groups. Teams of developers. Rust is proving to be product to Rust is proving to be a, product, a productive tool for collaborating amongst among large teams of developers with varying level of systems programming knowledge. Low-level code is prone to various subtle bugs, which is the most which in most other languages can be caught only through extensive testing and careful code review by experienced developers. In Rust, the compiler plays a gatekeeper role by refusing to compile code with the, these elusive bugs, including concurrency bugs. By, provide, by, by working alongside the compiler, the team can spend their time focusing on the program's logic rather than chasing down bugs. That's profound. But this you only know if you have worked in large teams. If you have been coding by yourself, do we need YOLO pushing to main they ain't talk about you. Rust also brings contemporary developer tools to the systems programming world. To the, to, to the systems programming world. Cargo. The included dependency manager and build tool makes adding, compiling, and managing dependencies painless and consistent across the Rust ecosystem. The Rust, SMT, uh, the Rust FMT formatting tool ensures a consistent coding style across developers. The Rust language server powers integrated development environment, IDE, integration. Integration for code completion and inline error messages. By using these and other tools in the, in the, in the Rust ecosystem, developers can, can be productive while writing systems level code. This actually is uh, cool here, man, like this cargo dependency tool, because cargo actually, what I like about it in this particular context, what we're doing today, is that it works the same on, on Linux, on Mac and also on Windows. You start cargo, and it's the same output. Sometimes it's not the same with other languages. You have to do some finicky stuff with like WSL or Windows, like subsystem Linux, blah, 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 whatever, right? I don't know what it is. But with, with the rest, cargo, ready to go, baby. All right. So students. Rust is for students and those who are interested in learning about systems concepts. If you're in Senegal. Using Rust, many people have learned about topics like operating system development. True. The community is very welcoming and happy to answer students' questions through efforts such, such as this book. The Rust team wants to make systems concepts more accessible to more people, essentially those new to programming. Come on, man. So if you don't know how to code, bro, this is it. You ain't, you ain't got to be worried, man. You got ChatGPT, you got me. You got a question, ping me on X or, you know, ask uh, our, our buddy GPT. Okay, so companies, hundreds of companies, large and small, use Rust in production for a variety of tasks, including command line tools, web services, DevOps tooling, embedded, embedded, embedded devices, audio and video analysis and transcoding, crypto, cryptocurrencies, <laughs> bioinformatics, search engines, and Internet of Things applications, machine learning, and even parts of the Firefox web browser. Come on, man. Rust is gangster, bro. Rust is everywhere. Open source developers. Rust is for people who want to build the Rust programming language. No, Rust is for people who want to build the Rust programming language, community, developer tools, and libraries. We love to have you contribute to the Rust language. That's a call, man. 
People who value speed and stability. Rust is for people who crave speed and stability in a language. By speed, we mean both how quickly Rust can, can run and speed at which lets you write programs. The Rust compiler checks ensure, no, the Rust compiler's checks ensure stability through features, additions, and refactoring. This is in contrast to the brittle legacy code in languages without these checks, which developers are often wait, which developers are often afraid to modify. By striving for zero zero cost abstraction, higher level features that compile to low level code as fast as code. No, okay. Let me again. I feel like a bush in my eye. You understand what I said? <laughs> Let me do some more. People who value speed and stability. Rust is for people who crave speed and stability in a language. By speed, we mean both how quickly Rust's code can run and speed at which Rust lets you write programs. The Rust compiler checks ensure stability through features, addition, and refactoring. This is in contrast, in contrast to the brittle legacy code in languages without these checks, which developers are often, are, are often afraid to modify. By striving for zero cost abstraction, higher level features that compile to lower level code as fast as code written manually, Rust en endeavors to make safe code to be fast code as well. Mm -mm -mm. All right then, brother. The Rust language hopes to support many other users as well. Those mentioned here are merely some of the biggest stakeholders. Overall, Rust's greatest ambition is to eliminate the trade-offs that programmers have accepted for decades by providing safety and product and, and product safety and product productivity and speed and ergonomics. Give Rust a try and see if its choices work for you. You know what they say in Thailand, right? It's up to you. <laughs> All right. Who was this book for? This book assumes that you've written code in any, any, in any programming language, but doesn't make any assumptions about which one. That's important. So in layman, layman term, you have to have, you have to have written in at least one programming language before attempting to write Rust. You have to have tried one programming language in the past before attempting Rust. And I believe it's a very valid argument. But I believe we're all gangsters, bro. We don't care. We're going to learn it. We got GPT. <laughs> we had nothing to be scared about, man. I think this book was written back in 2000 and whatever time. You know? That's what they were feeling at the time. But things changed. They didn't have GPT back then. But now we got it. So we got worries. Even if you knew, man, just learn, man. Just stop typing stuff in. You feel? Just type the thing in, man. Code the shit. Excuse my language. <laughs> All right, so, uh, okay, right? Okay, sorry, sorry, okay, okay. So this book, so this book assumes that you've written code in, uh, you've, that you've written code in any, any programming language, but doesn't make any assumptions about which one. We've tried to make the material broadly accessible to those from a wide variety of programming backgrounds. We don't spend a lot of time talking about what programming is and how to think about it. If you're entirely new to programming, you will be better served by reading a book that specifically provides an introduction to programming. Okay. We're gonna do it anyway. So if you gangster with it, continue on. How to use this book? In general, this book assumes that you are reading it in sequence from front to back, period. In general, this book assumes that you are reading this book in sequence from front to back. And I know some people want to jump it around in the book, jump here, jump there, like, oh, what about this chapter? What about that chapter? I heard this thing, this thing. Don't do that, bro. I'm telling you, if you want to learn Rust, go from chapter one to chapter N in the end. That's it. No other way. Okay? In, in sequence, front to back. Let's just do it like that. Just trust me. Trust me. Later, chap later chapters build on concept in earlier chapters, and earlier chapters might not delve into details on a particular topic, but will revisit this, the topics in a later chapter. But will revisit the topic in a later chapter. So no worries, everything, and I'll point it out as well. 
and I also point out which parts are important for Solana, which parts are up important for understanding like those casually constructs, especially if you are new to programming. I'm not saying like no new to programming, but like you've dabbled, you've taken a you know code academy course, you've typed it in, you took taken a couple of interviews, maybe it didn't quite work out, maybe you did a coding bootcamp, you know what I'm saying? And then now it's like okay, well what do I do? Let's chat GPT taking all the jobs. True. But blockchains are permissionless. So you can no excuse to write some code. Alright. <clears throat> okay? So You'll find two kind of chapters in this book. Concept chapters and project chapters. In concept chapters, you will learn about the, an, aspect, an aspect of Rust. In project chapters, we'll build small programs together, applying what you've learned so far. Chapter 2, 12, and 20 are project chapters, and the rest are concept chapters. Like I pointed out, right? We go back to here. Chapter 2, programming guessing game. Chapter 12, the command line tool. In chapter 20, the web server. Okay? You actually have like actually two, three big beefy actually projects you can do if you want to, um, you know, if you want to, you know what I mean? Mm. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, introduction. I'm still, I'm still, I'm still here. What are we? Okay. okay. Right? So we got three chapters, right? Two, 12, and 20. Project chapters. The rest of them are concept chapters. Right, so chapter one explains how to install Rust, how to write a hello world program, and how to use Cargo Rust Package Manager to build and build a tool. Chapter two is a hands-on introduction to writing a program in Rust, having you build a number, a number guessing game. Here we cover concept in a high level, and later chapters will provide additional detail. If you want to get your hands dirty right away, chapter two is a place for that. But we're going to skip. No ass. Chapter 3 covers Rust features that are similar to those of other programming languages. And in Chapter 4, you will learn about Rust ownership system. And this is where all hell is going to break loose. <laughs> now I'm playing. It's just that like ownerships, if, especially if you're coming from like other programming languages, would take a little bit of time to understand. But like anything, again, like I, like I said before, like the German says, right, anything is difficult until you learn how to do it. Anything. It's difficult until you learn how to do it. Ownership is a little bit different from other concepts in programming, but it is not overly complicated, obviously. It takes a while to just understand. But I think I have a way of explaining it, which makes it very, very simple to grasp. So if you trust me, let's move forward. Okay? So, where were we again? Um, in the chapter two, okay, um, all right, so, okay, what it says again, right? The chapter two is, uh, okay, so, uh, he, here we cover the concept in a, at a high level, and later chapters will provide additional detail. If you want to get your hands dirty right away, chapter two is the place for that. Chapter three covers Rust features that are similar to those of other programming languages. In chapter four, you will learn about Rust ownership. If you're a particular meticulous learner, you prefer to learn every detail before moving on the next one, you might want to skip chapter two. To skip chapter two, is exactly what I was saying. If you're a meti particularly meticulous learner who prefers to learn every detail before moving on to the next, you might want to skip chapter two and go straight to chapter, chapter four. Okay? Most important sentence here, right? So we're, we're, so we're going to chip three for sure, okay? Chapter three. Returning to chapter two, when you'd like to work on a project applying the details you've learned. Yes. So why put it on two? Second position. Why not put it like later, like 11 or so? Come on, man. Why two? Okay, anyway. There's a choice that they made. We're going to have to live with it. So, chapter five uh, discusses structs and methods. Um, like, very, very important. And chapter six covers the enums. Very important. Match expressions. Very important. The E flat control flux contract. Very important. You will use structs and enums to make custom types in Rust. Very important. Chapter seven, you learn about Rust module systems and have prep, uh, and, and about privacy rules for organizing your code in its public application programming interface, API, right? And its public application programming interface, right? Chapter eight discusses, actually, again, uh, well, chapter seven is very important, but it's going to, not going to be too much coding, but more like how do we organize our code in, the part in this particular context. So that's going to be all right. Chapter eight discusses some common collection data structures that the standard library provides, such as vectors, strings, and hash maps. 
Chapter 9 explores Rust error handling philosophies and techniques. Chapter 10 digs into generics, traits, and lifetimes, which gives you the power to define code that applies to multiple types. Chapter 11 is about testing, which even with Rust safety guarantees is necessary to ensure your program logic is correct. In chapter 12, we build your, uh, uh, we'll build our own implementation of a subset of functionality from the grep command line tool and searches for text within files. For this, we'll use many of the concepts we discussed in the previous chapters. Chapter 13 explores closures, iterators, uh, closures, iterators um, features of Rust that comes uh, from functional programming languages. In chapter 14, we'll uh, examine cargo in more in depth and talk about best practices for sharing uh, your libraries and other, in, with others. Chapter 15 discusses smart pointers that the standard library provides and the traits that enable that functionality. Chapter 16 will walk through different models of concurrency programming and talk about how Rust helps you to program in multiple threads fearlessly. Chapter 17 look at how, looks at how Rust idioms compare to object-oriented programming principles you might be familiar with. Chapter 18 is a reference to pattern, patterns and pattern matching, which I love actually in Elixir which are powerful ways of express, expressing ideas throughout Rust. Chapter 19 contains a, uh, a smorgasm, a smorgasm, smorgasbord. A smorgasbord? Is that how you said it? Chapter 19 contains a smorgasbord of advanced topics of interest, including unsafe Rust macros and more lifetime traits, types, functions, and closures. In chapter 10, we'll complete a project in which we implement a low-level multi-threaded web server, low-level. Finally, some appendices containing useful information about the languages in a more reference-like format. Appendix A covers Rust keywords. Appendix B covers Rust operators and symbols. Appendix C covers um, derivable traits, not derivable traits provided by the standard library. Appendix D covers some useful development tools. And Appendix E explains Rust editions. Appendix F, you can find translations of the book and Appendix G will cover how Rust is made and what nightly Rust is used. There is no wrong way to read this book. <laughs> After I said, like, go front to front, front, front to back. <laughs> there, is no wrong, there is no wrong way to read this book. If you want to skip ahead, go for it. I say, don't. <laughs> you might have to jump back to early chapters if you experience some inner confusion, but do whatever works for you. It's up to you. <laughs> An important part of the process of learning Rust is, is learning how to read the error messages, compa the, the compiler displays. This will guide you through towards working code. As such, we'll provide many examples that don't compile, along with the error messages that, comp the, that the compiler will show you in each situation. Know that if you, enter, uh, if you enter and run a random example, it may not compile. Make sure you read the surrounding text to see whether the example you're trying to run is meant to error or meant to work, actually. It's very important, sometimes confusing in a book. Ferris will help you distinguish errors that isn't meant to work. Sometimes you tap, you follow the book, you tap it in, oh, it doesn't work, why oh, doesn't work? Well, the next paragraph tells you exactly why it doesn't work. You just didn't, wasn't too patient to kind of read and follow through, right? So make sure you read all the way through the, the thing before you complain about, like, it doesn't work. Yeah, you know, right? Anyway, so, well, actually, Ferris, so Ferris, 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 is, Ferris is a crab, is a mascot of the Rust programming language, right? Look here, that's why, that's why I have, you know, that's why I have it. In the um, I have like ChatGPT maybe that image for the logo that I use. Actually, I use Dali in ChatGPT to make the Ferris lifting weights image. <laughs> okay, so Ferris with a question mark. This code does not compile. Ferris with its close up. This code panics. This uh, Ferris, I guess, I guess with one claw up. This code does not produce the desired behavior in most situations. Um, we lead you, we le we lead you to the correct version of any code that does not compile. So the idea is, do not be in a rush. Source code: the source files in which this book is generated can be found on GitHub. So if you find an error, you can click on this thing. I don't want to go there right now; it's necessary. And then come back and then um, you know maybe like do a actually screw. Fuck it. You can go to Rustlang the book. If you see here, there's pull request 49, issues 18149, right? But if you find an error, you come here, fork it, right? Boom, fork it here, and then, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, make a pull request or something like that, right? Okay. So this was the introduction, okay? So now, yeah, so here we have getting started. 
which is the number one chapter one right so here we'll basically do the basic stuff because i just want to get you going and like uh, do like uh, what i call like um, uh, install fest you know today just to kind of get you get you type in and and like maybe come back tomorrow and then we can type some more and all that stuff right but today we'll just more like motivate you get you to like get your fingers rolling man because Coliseum is coming up in a few days, man. I think it's a, it's a great way to practice, man. Just get get the blood flowing and everything else. And start write some code and get better, man. Code, get better by building stuff. Well, again, building products, for, build, actually building products or services. And we can I can talk about it at, 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 at you know, like uh, at, at, at the term. You can talk about it for a very long time because I want to create a new economy, man. You know what I mean? So let's do this, okay? So chapter one, getting started. Oops, 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 oops. getting started, okay? So let's close this. It's gonna distract it. It's brought it to it, okay. So let's start your Rust journey. There's a lot to learn, but every journey starts somewhere. In this chapter, we'll discuss installing Rust or Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. Writing a program that prints Hello World. Using Cargo Rust Package Manager and build a system. Okay? So this is like the bare minimum, core minimum. And probably this is the first, only time we'll probably use my um, uh, my terminal because then actually I, I think after, after, after chapter one we're going to basically start using um, VS Code 100 percent right so make sure that actually we are on VS Code we don't, we, don't, we don't have to use this because this is the same thing um, this is the same thing here that you see here is the same thing as as this here right the same files same thing right. So why do I basically have to switch, switch, switch context? But today, I want you to focus on the terminal and focus exactly what Rust does and not VS Code. And that's why we are using the terminal today. All right? That's the only reason actually why we're doing it. All right? So actually, let me come back here. And then we'll just, uh, again, we'll read and we'll just try it. Okay. So install Rust on the Windows, with, uh, Mac, or whatnot. So installation. So this, I might disappoint you. <laughs> because... I'm actually not going to show you how to install Rust. Like in this day and age, with ChatGPT and everything else, right? What I showed you earlier on ChatGPT, when I say, hey, go ask ChatGPT, how do I install Rust on my machine, on my Linux or whatever, right? How do I install, again, right? How, how do I install Rust on my Windows, Windows computer? Simple as that. How do I say all this? It will tell you. Right there. Right? This command is kind of the same for everything, but I want you to have the hacker spirit, and I want you to basically go and try to like install this stuff on your own if you don't have it. That is the first step. Like, can you actually go and read documentation and install this thing on your computer? But if you do have a Mac, it's very, very simple. Right? I, I, I don't know Mac personally or Linux, if you don't know Linux, right? All you have to do is take this command, copy it, right? Come back to the command line, and let me type it here. Let me grow it up and type this command here. This is it. Actually, I made a mistake, sorry. These, um, this dollar sign is not part of it. Right? Actually, it's everything after the dollar sign. Okay, when you type this, because I already have like Rust installed, I don't want to type this again, right? But once you type this, it will take a while, it will take maybe like 15 minutes or so, depending on your computer and how strong it is, and it will basically finish up, and it will run for a while, and it will finish up, okay? And then once you have it finished, now once you have it like, um, uh, once you have it like, uh, um, like, like uh, finished now, right? Oops, Let's see, I did it again. Oops, come on, okay. Okay, so once it's finished, you should type cargo and you should basically see it output. If you see cargo, you type cargo, you see something like this, then you are Gucci. You're golden to go. Okay? And also, if you also can type also like maybe like Rustup, right? It will also say the same thing. It will give you like Rustup toolchain for installer. And if you type like Rustup, boom, sorry. Uh, I'll put so you can see it like so. If you put Rustup update. It should update your Rust and show you exactly what you need, okay? So you don't have to worry about it. All right, so let's go back to our book. So now you type this command, it's installed. Rust is installed now, great, it's, it's simple. Type this command, boom, 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 takes a few minutes, it's installed, right? If we, if we ever, ever get an error message, copy the error message and put it into ChatGPT, right? Or post it on Twitter or somewhere, or X, whatever, and somebody will come with your help, okay? And then now, if you're Mac OS, you gotta get the get the Xcode C the the um the C compiler running by running uh, the Xcode tool, select blah blah blah, 
And what should have I done? Then the Linux installer should run GCC, Clang. This is details of it, right? But this is like the hacker, what I call like the actual hacker section. Troubleshooting. To check whether or not Rust is installed correctly, open the shell into this following command, right? Rust C dash dash version. We're not, we're not going to cut and paste. We don't like doing that. So we're going to do, again, we're going to clear our thing. And we're going to do Rust C dash dash version. Boom. And we're going to Rust C 1.750. Right? And give you the date of whatever the version is. Okay? Of the compiler. So it's installed. So when you have this, you type it. You should see Rust version XYZ, which is like a semantic versioning of this 1.750. And it tell you the whatever this line is and then the year date blah 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 okay if you see this information you have installed rust successfully if you don't see this information check that rust is in your path system variable as follows on windows you can type echo path uh, on powershell you can type echo env path and then on uh, usually on uh, on thing on um, mac or whatever right if you type echo dollar sign path it should display your path oops i'm showing a lot of information but <laughs> Okay. Okay. So there it is. Updating it again. So rust up update. I just did it. And if you want to uninstall it, rust up self uninstall. It is that simple. Right? So again, see this page, right? It's like this long. From this page, if, if you cannot install rust, you should not basically go forward with this program. If from, from here, by using this, using the internet, using ChatGPT, you, you, can, you cannot install rust on your computer, my brother. We might have to uh, see you another time. All right. So there's no more light here, but it's all right. It's going to go. Let's just keep going, man. You don't need to see me. Let's keep it like, you know, sexy. <laughs> you know A little light. We, we're not going to, I'm not going to play some Erica, but Erica Badu, though. <laughs> we too much. All right. So, so this is right there. Okay. Getting started, right? So we did this. You want to, you, now, you're not happy. You want to you uninstall Rust? Type this command, rust up, self uninstall. Boom. It's out of your document. It's out of your computer. Okay? So, what I was talking about before, again, local documentation. The installation of Rust also includes a local copy of the documentation so, so that you can read it offline. This was amazing in Senegal, man. There'll be some days, bro, there'll be like no power, no internet. I don't give up. I bust my laptop out, bust my docs, man, and I'm like, just like, just checking out the details of Rust offline on this book, man. And it's amazing. Okay? So this is actually what you need. You need offline. From Rust app that, you open the local documentation in your browser. If any time, and so any time a type of or type or function is provided by the, by the standard library and you are not sure what it does or how to use it, use the application programming interface API documentation to find it. All right? So, and that will get to it as well. All right? So, hello world. We've been going for almost like hour and a half, man. We just get into hello world. But today is like a chill day, man. Today is just a Friday. You know, give you some time for Saturday for the weekend, so you can actually like really. Once I maybe I, I will upload like an edited version of the video, so you can watch it again and like see what I'm talking about. And this weekend, you and I will be coding together, man. Think about it, man. Whenever you're coding, bro, I'm right there next to you. You know what I mean? So whatever you are, man, in Senegal, in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Mali, uh, Ivory Coast, bro, you know what I'm saying, Burkina, Niger, man, the, the war, man, the war is cyber, bro, the war is cyber these days, man, so we need soldiers on the cyber front, so that's why we need people to learn Rust, actually, man, it's, be, it's even beyond blockchains at this point, it's straight up warfare, you feel me? So let's actually go. All right. So this is actually like our hello world. We're gonna just like let's actually do this like chapter one program. We got twenty minutes, so actually we feel good out, good about ourselves and we finish it up real quick, right? Okay. So now that you've installed Rust, it's time to write your first Rust program. It's traditional when learning a new language to write a little program that prints the, the text "Hello World." In any programming language in the world, usually the first program that you write is to write something that writes on the screen "Hello World." Right. So, again, now that, now, now, that you, now that you've installed Rust, it's time to write your first Rust program. It's traditional when learning a new language to write a little program that prints the text, hello world, to the screen. So we'll do the same here, right? So note, this book assumes basic familiarity with the command line. Rust makes no specific demands about your editing or tooling or where, or where your code leaves 
So if you prefer to use an integrated development environment IDE instead of the command line, feel free to use your favorite IDE. Many IDEs have some degree of Rust support. Check the IDE's documentation for details. The Rust team has been focusing on enabling great IDE, uh, IDE support via Rust Analyzer and uh, CD Appendix and its information is there. And also like when you watch the video by uh, uh, my man in the GitHub uh, from uh, Let's Get Rusty, you will also see how to install the Rust Analyzer from the video, right? So again, we gotta be a hacker, bro. Gotta understand how to write these things, Google it up, look it up, put it on GPT, all right? So creating uh, a, project, a, 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 a project directory. You will start by making a directory to store your Rust code. It doesn't matter to it doesn't matter Rust where your code leaves for the exercises and project in this book. We suggest no, but for the exercises and projects in this book, we suggest making a projects directory in your home directory and keep all your projects there. Okay, so open terminal, enter the following um, commands and to, uh, to make a project directory and a directory for the hello world project within the projects directory. <laughs> Open a terminal and enter the following commands to make a project's directory and a directory for the Hello World project within the project directory. For Linux, Mac OS, PowerShell, blah, 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 it's going to do it, right? So, again, this now is where we're going to basically show you how we can do this like side by side. So, we're going to take this, we're going to make a full screen out of it. We're going to go back here and we're going to bring our... thing here All right this is exactly how we're gonna do it so when we blow this up I like it's HTML the, the text will format auto format automatically if it was a PDF it wouldn't, wouldn't work this way and that's actually why I prefer to use the HTML version otherwise you think it right so it doesn't like okay so so from here what we're gonna do actually right so uh, things that actually need to happen is that you need to understand if you want to be a good developer or something like that you need to understand how I should learn how the terminal work this is a terminal here terminal this is here right I'm, I'm tapping here right this is what a terminal actually is right so you have to learn actually understand the commands how to navigate how to copy right how to CD how to navigate directories you know like little things that you got to do right how to make directories make their right how to remove directories how to remove files remove file or rm dir directory but only if the, if the directory is actually is empty all those things you have to actually have to learn like really because learning how to use the terminal you know learning how to use like 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 um uh what you might call it again um uh visual studio code is like learning how to use a tool like as a like as a like a, as an artist as a as a maker you know you got to understand how to use your tools right so uh, let me turn the light on, man. <clears throat> All right, let me see, man. If this thing is. Let's see, let's see. All right, seems like it's still going. Seems like it's still going, man. We got 50, 54 people watching, that's what's up, man. That's what's up, welcome, welcome, man. I didn't introduce myself and all that, but it's all right, man. It's all right, it's all right. Okay, so what are we gonna do now? So what, actually, what this is actually, I have a directory here called Jim. This is like really the, my, uh, this is my uh, Coliseum Jim that I had. This actually has the notes. The read me everything everything that you see on the on the github um for that stuff is basically here right everything that's in the github uh for this all right everything that's here is here it's pretty much this github right so this is where i push the stuff out and i put good status man i cannot type bro. if i do good status right you can see now we added like this thing called notes and a thing called Rust, a directory called Rust and a file called Node, right? So we haven't, we haven't been tracking them. So we haven't really added them yet, but we'll add them as we go. But this is what, what we have, okay? So this everything is there. Okay, so now that said, what, what do we, what did they ask us to do? They said, okay, well, 
uh, you start by making a direct, uh, uh, okay, creating a project directory. Okay, you start by making a directory to store your Rust code. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to Rust where the code lives. But for the exercises and projects in this book, we suggest making a projects directory in your home directory and keeping all the projects there. Open a terminal and, and enter the following commands to make the projects directory and directory in, to make a projects directory and a directory for the hello world project within the projects directory. For Linux, Mac OS, PowerShell, and Windows, please enter blah blah blah. Okay, so what do we uh, what do we do here? So they want us to make this thing called projects, right? So we make it here, or uh, should we go inside the Rust uh, folder that we just made? I think so. And then here we're gonna make this thing called projects, obviously. Okay, so we're gonna see the projects, Western projects, nada, and then here. We're going to make another directory called hello world. Is that what it asks us to do? All right? So you say, make a directory called projects, cd into projects, make a directory called hello world, and cd into hello world. All right? So, well, we have to cd into hello world then. Where are we right now? We're in hello world right now, right? Uh, projects. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, do you know I make one? Okay, cd into hello world. There you go. Boom. So, where are we? We are in the Hello World now, so now we are in a moment to like long oh, yes. <laughs> Back in the gym, Rust, Projects, Hello World. All right, not long, but whatever, man. This just happens to you in a way. If, you, if you're using Windows, we're not going to help you. You're on Windows, bro. Get on Linux on Mac. Sorry, bro. Uh, writing and running a Rust program. Next, make a source file and call it main.irs. All right, so how do we want to make this file? So usually on a uh, Visual Studio code, I will press the thing and make a file, but we're gonna have to learn how to use our command line, obviously. It's very important, right? So all these little commands, bro, chop, chop, right? Gotta learn how to use these things, right? So what are we gonna do now? So they say, okay, well, uh, writing and running a Rust program. Next, make a source file and call it main.rs. So we're gonna touch a file, call it main.rs. All right? So it's right there. It's the only file we get, right? All right. Um, May, um, call it main.rs. Rust files always end with the extension .rs. Extension. If you're using more than one word in your file name, the convention is to use an underscore to separate them. For example, hello world, hello underscore world .rs rather than hello world .rs. Okay, you saw it here, right? Um, we're gonna touch like right. So they said actually, they said ideally, you're gonna create a file called hello world underscore world. What they call like snake casing because it looks like a snake you know whatever that rs extension create a rust file right but this is forbidden so if you tap in here now we see two files right hello world and rs and main and rs and we can also like touch another file and call it hello world that rs two files different names if they have the same code probably do the same thing but this is a preferred way of writing things Right, and actually, you will see this actually also like when, we, when you write like large numbers with large zeros, it's always good to put this in the middle so you can actually read, properly read the number because actually this is just ignored, the underscore, right? So hello world rs blah blah, blah right? But that's really, so let's remove this hello world. Let's remove this hello world. Uh, one more thing, and we only got two here left. All right, so hello world and main rs, right? Actually, we don't even need this hello world. We just need the uh, we just need the rs. Okay, we just need the main rs. All right, okay. So now they said, okay, well, uh, underscore to separate them, right? For example, use underworld, uh, hello world underscore rs rather than hello world, uh, one word. Now open the main rs file you just created and enter the following code in listing one one. What is listing one one? It's listing one one right here. Listing one one, a program that prints hello world. And what is it? It's right here. This code, right? You can copy it, you can run it, but I said, do not copy it. Type it as you see it, word for word, letter for letter, character for character. Now, how we're going to do it here is going to be a little tricky because here we don't actually have VS Code because, again, I want to show you exactly how the command line works because then we're going to be familiar with the command line before we move to VS Code by the next chapter. So here we're going to use this thing called Nano. Nano, actually, we can use Vim. You know, of course, you can use Vim. You can use, um, you know, whatever you, Emacs, I love Emacs, Emacs Lisp, Lisp and all that stuff, whatever, right? But we don't want to do that, actually. We want to keep it very, very simple, right? So here, we want to use Nano, which is actually included in any, 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 any computer you, with Linux, Mac, you type, you type Nano, it's already, it's already installed, right? So we're going to basically Nano, main.rs, okay? So we're going to 
edit this file right it gives you like a, actually in uh, in shell editor it's very very simple very very basic but it's going to be good for our needs right now and also like it will allow us not to have like uh, uh, um, you know like uh, the coloring which 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 we call it again the the, uh, the colors for the fonts like for, like spacing space it out now you know because in the beginning, we want to write in, 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 in monochromatic so we can catch our errors in the beginning so we can like be very good right away when, when, we, when we like uh, start, right? Okay, so what we're going to do here, we say, okay, well, type this text exactly as is right now. Again, we're not going to copy it, we're going to type it exactly as is. So we're going to go fn main, okay, and then bring it here, and we're going to close this bracket because we ain't got no other complete here or whatnot. So we're going to do this, then we're going to go to print ln exclamation mark very very important it's a macro and not a function but we'll get to that later hello world make sure you have two two codes not single one like you like you're doing python it's not the same you actually are required to have like two uh codes a single word is for a, is for a single character so it's different so hello world and we copy here and then we have a semicolon to end it up right so again oops uh Fan function main boom 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 right. Is that what it asks us to do? Right? Function main open in bracket print ln exclamation hello world semi let's close this. Okay. How do we save this again? Or nano control x y to save the file. It will ask us if we want to write the write. We're going to ask us if we want to write the file to main.rs. We say yes. Boom. Now now the file is saved. Actually, if I do cat. Main that I just kind of see if my file is there. So my the, the output of the file is main that so it's there. Okay. So now we have created our file, save the file, and go back to your terminal window in the project hello world directory on Linux or Mac OS, enter the following command to compile and run the code. Okay, so da 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 da. Let's compile our code. Let's see main that RS enter. What's happening? What's happening? Hmm. It's taking a long time. Is it working? Is it broken? Did we make an error? Maybe not. I think it's just slow because you got to compile the first time, and there it is. It's finished. You're like, yo, what? Nothing happened. What happened? There's, there's no, there's no. What's going on? Well, we don't know because if we type L, now we see there's another file here, but it's red. What is this thing? Actually, can we read it? No, it's a binary file, right? Can we can we read the other file? Of course, main that RS. Yes, but main we can read it because main actually is a binary file. Okay, so how do we run it? Well, we gotta actually basically it should tell us actually right here on Windows enter the command that backslash main that exe instead of forward slash main. But you compile the file, nothing happens. Now we touch like that, right? Actually, let's clear again. Let's clear our thing, All right? So here, what do we do? All right? So here we just basically tell it that because we tell actually find the files exactly where we are in this particular directory, forward slash, and exec and run this binary. And what does it do? Hello world, and bravo! <laughs> you have written your first line ever. Of Rust. Alright? The first line ever actually ever, right? So let's read this here again. Regardless of your operating system, the string hello world should print to the terminal. If you don't see the output, refer back to the troubleshooting part of the installation section for ways to get help. If hello world did print, congratulations, you've officially written your first <laughs> Rust program. That makes you a Rust programmer? Or a Rastafarian, as I call them. Film. Okay? So now, if you got this running right, again, let's clear. Let's clear. Oh, let's increase the fonts for the home, as you can see. That forward slash main. Not main that RS. Only main. Because main that RS is a Rust file and not a binary. It's not executable. That main is an executable file. And if I type it right away, again, hello world comes in. This, guy, this time it comes faster because... Since it the first time actually it showed it up, it didn't have to. Sorry, actually, uh, compilation first compilation or second compilation? I forgot. But no, no, that's not important. But let's just read this before before actually it's over really quick. Because I see it's like 15 minutes left. 
And let's see actually if we can at least recover some of this stuff. Okay, sorry I've been talking a lot. All right. So, an anatomy of a Rust program. Let's review this Hello World program in detail. Here's the first piece of the puzzle. FN, main, paren, open bracket, close bracket. These lines define a function named main. The main function is special. It is always the first code that runs in every executable Rust program. Here, the first line declares a function named main that has no parameters and returns nothing. If there were parameters, they would go inside the parentheses, right? And then we can see that over time, obviously, like many, many, many examples, okay? The function body is wrapped in brackets. Rust requires curly brackets, sorry, the function body is wrapped in curly brackets. Rust requires curly brackets around all function bodies. It's a good style to place the opening curly bracket on the same line as a function declaration, adding the space in between. No, if you want to stick a standard to a standard style across Rust project, you can use the automatic formatter called Rust FMT, which is the same as in Go, Go FMT or Go Font. <laughs> they call it crazy. To format your code in a particular style, more on Rust FMT in Appendix D. The Rust team has included this tool with the standard with, with, with the standard Rust distribution as Rust C, as Rust C is, so it should already be installed on your computer. Okay? The body of the main function holds the following code. Print Ellen, hello world. This line does all the work in this little program. It prints text to the, to the screen. There are four important details to notice here. First, Rust style is to indent with four spaces, not a tab. Hmm. We'll come back to it. That's important, but not really. And I suggest actually you watch an episode of uh, Silicon Valley, the show uh, Tabs versus Spaces. It's a very funny episode. Anyway, so uh, this line does all the work in the little program. It prints text to the, to the screen. There are four important things to think, right? First, uh, first Rust style is to, to is to indent with four spaces, not a tab. Second, print Ellen calls a Rust macro. Like I said earlier, it's not a function, it's a macro. If it had called a function instead, it would be entered as println without the exclamation mark. We'll discuss Rust macros in more details in chapter 19. For now, you just need to know that using the exclamation uh, mark means that you're calling a macro instead of a normal function and that macros don't always follow the same rules as functions. Third, you see the hello world string. We pass this string as an argument to print Ellen. The print the string is printed to the screen. Fourth, the end of the line with a semicolon, which indicates that if this expression is over and the next one is ready to begin, most, uh, no, sorry. Fourth, we end the line with a semicolon, which indicates that this expression is over and the next one is ready to begin. Most lines of Rust code end with a semicolon. Annoying to me, they look like ants, but I prefer not to have them, but it's a compiled language and they want it, so what can I do? Compiling and running are separate steps. You've run a newly created program that lets you ex examine each step in the process. Before running the uh, Rust program, you must, compile and, uh, you must compile it using a Rust compiler by entering the Rust C command and passing, it, passing in the command of your source file like this. Rust C, as we did earlier, right? Rust C, main.rs. This basically, again, let's look at the, what the main.rs looks like again that rs, right, it's just this function, so all it does, okay? So we call rust c, we compile main rs. If you have a C or C++ background, you'll notice that this is familiar to GCC or Clang, which has compilers on Mac, on C, uh, on, on Unix, right? After compiling successfully, rust outputs a binary executable. Again, by, what is a binary execu executable? It's this file right here, with the, actually, it's like in red. This is executable. And actually, I have a crazy story of when I was in San Francisco, a company that was making millions of dollars based on one executable that they sent to people. It was a Go executable. And the talk was called Startup in a Binary. I believe in San Francisco, if you, if you can find it on YouTube, Startup in a Binary. And it was about a, uh, a genome company which makes this custom intellectual property like whatever module for genome testing they compile it, it's in a binary, and they ship the binary to people, and they're making billions of dollars. That was fascinating to me. When you write code in Python or actually JavaScript, you have to ship the, that particular source code to the person. It's not compiled, it's interpreted. So your code is visible to anybody. 
Yes, there's people who try to compile to compile binaries and blah blah blah, whatever, whatever, right? But most likely, if you compile your, if you have, if you if you write a program, and it's your intellectual property, and you compile it, and it's a binary, you could take the binary, give it to anybody, and they won't be able to see what's inside the binary. And that's what you call a startup in a binary. Look it up, man. It was a go. It was from the Go Meetup, I think, in San Francisco, maybe like five years ago. Amazing talk. I gotta find it again. Okay. So. After compiling successfully, let's output by the executable, right? On Linux, Mac OS, PowerShell, or Windows, you can see the executable by entering the ls command in your shell. ls main, right, like I did earlier. ls, or ls, actually, I, I did l, but you can do ls also. ls is uh, lists like uh, list them, and whatever. List, what the s for? I forgot. Let's list. list. I, I, I usually use l or the command. It's a shortcut in, uh, in the thing. Okay? So, on Linux, Mac OS, you will see two files. With PowerShell and Windows, you will see the same three files that you should uh, see using command. With command on Windows, you will enter the following thing. Command, what's up with Windows people, man? Ah, oh, come on, man. This shows the source code with the file. This shows the source code file with the .rs extension, the executable file. Main that .exe, and Windows, but main all of the platforms. And when, you, when you're using Windows, a file containing debugging information with a PDB extension, and you're running the main, like, what is up with Windows? Yeah, I need to just, like, give it up, man. Like, why? If your main RS is your hello world pro, uh, if, if, if your main RS is your hello world program, that this line prints hello world. What does it say? If your main that RS is your hello world program, this line prints hello world to your terminal. Okay. If you're more familiar with the dynamic language such as Ruby, Python, JavaScript, you might not be used to compiling and running programs as separate steps. Rust is an ahead of time compile language. Meaning you can compile a program and give it the executable to someone else and they can run it even without having Rust installed. <laughs> I am telling you, man, start up in a binary. You can just basically make it executable, send it to someone somewhere in the world, and they can basically have it running. And that's exactly also how computer viruses work. <laughs> so Black Hat Rust, check it out, man. You'll be a fascinating book, bro. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, right? So, but... Uh, it's okay. Uh, meaning you can compile a program and give it the, the, the execu executable to someone else and they can run it even without having Rust installed. If you give someone uh, that a Ruby file, that RB, a Python file, that, that, that PY, a uh, JavaScript file, that JS file, they will need to have Ruby or Python or JavaScript installed. In actually, they will need to have Ruby, Python or JavaScript implementations installed respectively. But in those languages, you only need one command to compile and run your program. Everything is a trade-off in language design, obviously. Just compiling with Rust-C is fine for simple programs. As your project grows, you will want to manage all your options and make it easy to share your code. Next, we'll introduce you Cargo Tool with the help to write real-world programs. <laughs> Two hours. Two hours. Hello, Cargo. We're here, man. But this is so important, actually, the Cargo, how Cargo works. I'm going to leave it up next time, because I'm actually tired. I've been talking for a while. My coffee, cold. But you see what I'm saying, right? This thing is not complicated, man. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not complicated, man. The, the reality is that we want to get better at coding, right? And actually, let me leave you with a video. I'm not sure if I can share it on YouTube, but this is the video that my mentor played me when I was learning how to code. This is the video that changed me. I shared this video, bro. Oh, there you go. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to play this video. I'm going to take off my headphones, and I'm going to leave this video with you guys, and the next time we'll see you, I'll see you guys, right? Let me take my, let me take my thing off. Let me close, I don't need to close the door. But hopefully you guys can hear this video. Ah, read. Hey, listen. Listen, you, you have, have just a little, little bit more attitude than, than I like, like but I'm decided, decided I'm gonna dog you no matter, matter what. what. Okay? Listen to me. Okay. I know you want to say. 
I, I love, love to sing. sing. Nothing, Nothing makes me happier. I either want, want to be a singer, singer or the head of the ice cream. Hey, do you know what ice cream is? Don't roll your eyes. eyes. They were very cool. I went, I went to, to my, my mother, mother gave me this book. My letters, letters to a young poet, Raina Maria Rilke. Rilke. It's a fabulous writer. A fella used to write to him and say, I want to be a writer. Please read my stuff. And Rilke, Rilke says to this guy, don't ask me about being a writer. If when you wake up in the morning, you couldn't think of nothing but writing, then you're a writer. I want to say the same thing to you. If you wake up in the morning and you can't think of anything but singing first, then you're supposed to be a singer, girl. What's the point of your story, sister? What's the point? Read the book. And don't, don't roll your eyes about the ice capades. It was a very good living. I just, just want to point that out. I just wanted to like uh, say um, I'm really happy that we covered actually chapter one today. So let's actually go back to here and let's go back to our notes. We go to projects. We go to notes. Uh, boom. Let's go to our notes, man. So what notes? What it looked like was this. We're gonna close it. And we're going to put an X. Actually, we're not going to put X because we're not really done yet. Tomorrow we'll be done. So let's, let's not do that. Let's not actually like, compete. Like, we're not going to done yet. So the idea is that um, I want you to, like, if you, this is what my, my, my mentor played me, man, when I was learning how to code, bro, when I was like really struggling, man, because the idea is that if you really want to learn how to code, man, you have to like really think about this thing 24 seven. It's gotta be in your brain. It's got really gotta be consume you in a lot of ways, man. Think, think about it in the shower. You think about it before you go to bed. You got this burning desire to build this thing, man. Again, this product, this, this actually this product or the service itself, right? But the idea is that like, the idea is that um, like, just like start small, man, like slow, man, because a lot of it is very difficult, man. A lot of it is, a lot of it is never easy, man. Otherwise everybody would be doing this stuff, right? So start easy, man. Start small, like really, like slowly but surely, man. But one chapter at a time, man. But type the stuff that you see it. As you see it, as you see it today, like type the stuff in one by one, man. Today we rambled a lot today because I wanted to like really get you motivated, get you going, and understand also my motive as well. What is your motive, man? What is your motive for doing this stuff? What is your motive for learning this stuff? This stuff is very difficult. You could have been on the beach today, chilling in the sun, sipping margaritas, but we are here learning how like borrow checker works and shit. You are already dedicated, man. You're already there, man. You're already halfway, so might as well just like really put your mind and like just like really learn how to code this shit. I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm actually talking directly like this because I, I, I know some people, some friends of mine are, are, are listening today. My cousin is listening, and this is specifically for you, man, because I know you've been trying to learn code for a long time, and this is your chance right now. But the idea is that if you're gonna code here, there, blah blah blah, it's not gonna work. You're gonna have to write code every single day and find people to code with. Code every single day. Find people to code with, man. This stuff is hard, but it's fun as well. It's very rewarding. If you can, like, really, you know, climb that hill, man, like they say, right? It's definitely definitely very steep. But you see the, you see, you see the Olympics, man. It's, this thing is no joke, man. This thing is no joke. Like, we're all Olympians now because we, we live in a global village. We all want to live good, man. Travel the world, like, work remote, have a remote, fancy remote job, be in Bali. Who doesn't want, who doesn't want that? But the reality that is, is that the same thing that you want, man, somebody else wants it and is probably hungrier than you. Since we are all competing at the global stage at this very, very moment, man, the idea is now, man, there's no time to play, bro. Code every day, man. Write code every day. All right? But you're already starting the right path. You're here today. You listen to me. You'll be like, you, do, you actually listen to like a recorded video. I always try to motivate you, man. I mean, you can call me your coach, man. Coach Fo Day. <laughs> That's why this is a gym. <laughs> Actually, I didn't make the correlation. But I'm your coach, man. I'll be more than happy to be your coach, man. I'm not the best programmer. I'm not the most smart person. I'm not the whatever. But I'm very, very motivated. And I'm a very, very curious person. And it's what drives me to like really look at technologies and code and build the stuff and deploy stuff and all these things, man. But I want you to come on this journey with me because it's very hard. I don't know everything. I'm still learning. You can tell. I'm still learning. I can't even read. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? 
So anyway, man, it's been real. It's my first uh, live stream on uh, on X Men. I wanna, I'm hoping to do this like on a regular basis now. We got like a month before uh, Coliseum. We wanna do eight chapters. Today was chapter one, just to get you installed. Try it out, man. Install it. Tap the stuff in, man. And then tomorrow we'll ta tackle the, the the last part of like uh, chapter one. Then we'll go forward, man. By chapter three, you will be right into it, man. And we we'll start even. I, I would like to start talking about the Solana stuff early, right? Because again, it's not about like Rust alone. It's Rust, Anchor, and Solana. Actually, and TypeScript, but <laughs> don't forget about TypeScript. We're gonna focus like strictly on Rust today, okay? So, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, man. I hope I wasn't too much of a. <laughs> My reading wasn't like a, a fifth grade level. <laughs> oh man. Anyways, man, it's been real, man. So, uh, deuces. <laughs>